Hey everyone, Steve here once again with a video on my new Hackintosh. If you've followed my videos before, you'll know I've had Hackintosh since 2014 that has seen OS releases from Maverick 10.9 to Sierra 10.12. Unfortunately, over the past year and a half, my need for a dedicated Windows desktop has increased. Also, the challenges to get Sierra running on my old hardware didn't help either, so I felt it was time to move my Hackintosh hobby to a different machine. So, after looking around, I found a new PC that would suit my needs. That machine is the Gigabyte Bricks Pro GB BXI7 5775. The main reasons I went with this was for the support on the Tony Mac XA6 forums since it has similar specs to an Intel Nook and was well priced for $249 on Newegg. In addition to the PC, I also picked up 8GB of DDR3 1600MHz RAM to get the PC running. That cost me around $67 and change. For storage, I grabbed an SSD I had lying around, which is a Samsung Evo 850 250GB version. You can find a similar size SSD for less than $80 on Amazon if you look around. Now you know the hardware I'm using, but let's get to the main point of this video, which is installing the OS. I'll be showing how I got Mac OS Sierra 10.12 to run on this machine, not the latest OS, High Sierra. Some of the patches that I'll be demonstrating in Sierra don't exactly work in High Sierra. As soon as I find a way to keep the PC stable in High Sierra, I'll gladly make a video on it. The specific OS version that I will be installing is Sierra 10.12.6, which is the most recent at the time of this recording, that can always be found on the Mac App Store. But of course, I'll need accompanying software and patches to get this running smoothly. Before I get to that, I want to thank ToyMacXA6.com for the software and patches as well as the forum community because without them, this would not have been possible. Starting with software from ToyMac, I'll need copies of UniBees for the installer media, MultiBees for the post-installation patches and the installation of Clover, and EFI Mounter V3 for remounting the EFI partition after restarts. I'll also need software outside of ToyMac such as Clover Configurator from SourceForge, the SSDT power management kex from GitHub by user Piker Alpha, the Realtek ALC audio script from GitHub by user Tolita, the iKex kex installer utility from Dr. Hurt on Insanely Mac, an original copy of Apple HDA.kext. I got mine on Tony Mac, but there are other websites that offer this file as well. Finally, a USB with at least 8GB of space will be needed. Now that we got the software and USB, Let's begin with media creation. On a Mac with a copy of Sierra downloaded and the USB inserted, I ran Disk Utility to format the USB with a Mac OS Extended Drill format and a GUI partition scheme. Once the disk was formatted, I ran the UABs application and went through the intro pages. For specific selections, I selected Sierra OS, UEFI boot, and no check marks to any injected kex. After all that, I just selected OK and allowed the media to be installed onto the USB. The average time to install this was 15 to 20 minutes. When this was done, I moved a copy of the programs I'll need later onto the USB. Powering up the system with the UniBeast drive inserted, I pressed F12 on my keyboard to get into the boot options and selected the USB. At the Clover screen, I selected the USB option and waited for the installer media to start up. At the installer menu, I went to Utilities, Disk Utility, and formatted the SSD inside the PC. I named the SSD Sierra, and gave the SSD a GUI partition scheme and a Mac OS Extended Drone format. With that format, I went through the installer and waited around 10 minutes to install. When the installation finished, the PC restarted and booted into the UnBeast drive. This time, I selected my SSD for boot. Within a minute, I got to the standard Apple setup screen like on all their PCs and went through that. Now that the OS is on this machine, it's time to start patching. The first piece of software I used for my UnBeast drive was MultiBeast. Extracting and running it, I selected these options in this order. Under Quick Start, I selected UEFI Boot Mode. On the Drivers tab, under Network, I selected the first Realtek option, 
version 2.0.0. I didn't select anything on the USB page and kept the clover selection on the bootloader tab. Under the Customize tab, the only thing I edited was unchecking the iMac 14.2 option under System Preferences. I'll be fixing that later in Clover Configurator. With those items selected, I clicked the Install button and waited for MultiBeast to do its thing. A few minutes later, MultiBeast was finished. I also had my EFI partition mounted as well. So, to take advantage of this, I ran Clover Configurator next. Running Clover Configurator, I had to open my config.plist file. The quickest way to get to that is on the bottom of the window if the EFI partition is mounted. Navigating to a tab called Boot, I checked that the default boot volume was correct and not pointing to a different place. The next tab I went to was the Graphics tab to enable the integrated Iris Pro graphics. I made sure the Inject Intel box was checked and in the text box labeled IG Platform ID, I placed this hexadecimal value. Under the following tab, Kernels and Kex to patch, I added an entry to fix the trim support for my SSD. To add a new row, I pressed the plus icon at the bottom of the window and added these values to the name, find, replace, and comment cells. Without this, the PC will lock up at random times or may not wake up from sleep in some cases. In the SM BIOS tab, this is where I made my system definition in iMac 16,2. To do this, I just clicked on the up-down button and selected the iMac from the drop-down list. I then copied the value from the serial number box and pasted that into the RT variables tab in the MLB text box along with five random digits. All that was left to do was save my config.plist file, close Clover Configurator, and restart without my Unibase drive. This time, my system booted up from my SSD thanks to Clover. Patching the audio was up next after the reboot. I started with creating an audio shell script by opening a terminal window and entering this command to download the script to my home directory. I then ran this change mode command to make the script executable. I didn't run the script yet because I had to install the Apple HDA Kex first into the system. So I extracted and ran iKext, dragged an extracted copy of the HDA Kex into the program, and allowed it to install. I had to restart to make sure that it was installed properly. After the restart, I opened the terminal again and ran this command to run the script I made. During the install, I said yes to install type my password to confirm, and yes again. The script installed within a few seconds, and when done, I restart again for the changes to take effect. You can hear that it worked when I was testing with some headphones. Proceeding the Piker Alpha shell script, this should, in theory, allow the OS to detect all available devices and potentially help with power management. I opened the terminal window and entered this command to download the script. Next, I entered the change mode command to allow the downloaded script to become executable. Then, I ran this command to execute the script, which only took a few seconds. When a question came up on whether to open a .dsl file, I entered no. Finally, I entered this command to open a finder window to two generated files made by this script. Moving that window over temporarily, I ran EFI Mounter V3 to remount my EFI partition. When a new finder window opened to the EFI partition, I navigated to this directory. Moving this window to the side and bringing back my original window, I made copies of both generated files and placed them in the patch folder. Later, I restarted the PC to make the changes go into effect. After the restart, I checked the About This Mac page to check on if the changes I made were noticed. You can see for yourself that the iMac 16,2 definition was used and that the trim support was enabled. This was optional, but I also did some updating to get the OS to latest patches. And this is a simple process with just using the Mac App Store and restarting. 
The one downside to take note of when updating, audio will be broken after updating and will have to be reinstalled using the steps I used earlier. Because of this, I'm always keeping a copy of these three items. With that last step done, I now have fully functional Hackintosh. After using the PC for a couple months, I've run into a few issues which I'll address here. The first issue is audio. So far, audio only comes through the 3.5mm jack and not through an HDMI connection or mini display port. For me, this isn't a problem since I normally use headphones, but this may be a concern to others. I can't confirm if the SPDIF option works due to not owning any equipment with that connection, but I do have the option appear in the sound settings. And as I already acknowledged earlier, any OS patches breaks audio and needs to be reinstalled after patching. A second issue is with wireless and Bluetooth. The Wi-Fi Bluetooth card that's installed in the PC is an Azure Wave AW-CB161H. According to the Tony Mac community, this card is not supported by Apple. One possible solution to remedy this would be finding a new card that is both supported by Apple and that's compatible with the mini PCIe slot on the board. The other solution that I used was a USB dongle alternative. Using a cheap Wi-Fi dongle I purchased on Amazon and installing the drivers, I can connect my Hackintosh to my local network and gain internet access that way. Also, with a Bluetooth 2.0 dongle I had lying around, I was able to connect Bluetooth peripherals to my Hackintosh, like for example, a mouse. The downside to this solution though is that you can lose up to two USB ports when there are only four to work with on the PC. It's up to user preference at that point if you really need wireless connectivity. A third issue with this PC is starting up and shutting down. When starting up the PC, it's possible that after going from the Clover boot screen to the Apple loading screen, a no symbol appears to stop booting. This occurs at random times and happened a lot during the installation of this OS. I had just found a patch to fix this after producing the first portion of this video, which I'll address here. On the desktop with the EFI partition mounted, I went through the partition to find this file and delete it. Next, I started Clover Configurator, opened my config.plist file, went to the RT variables tab, and replaced the value in the CSR active config text box with hex67. Then, I went to the Install Drivers tab and clicked on the button with this label on it and allowed that KEX to install. Finally, I just saved my config.plist file and restarted, and that seemed to fix the startup issue. Now getting to the shutdown portion, it's known that the PC may not turn off after intentionally shutting it down or restarts after a few seconds of being off. The only temporary solution I could come up with is opening the config.plist file in Clover Config going to the ACPI tab and checking the fixed shutdown checkbox under fixes. This seems to cut down on the amount of times the PC doesn't shut down all the way and restarts, but doesn't help with waking when USB devices are used, added, or removed. The last issue is with the fan on the PC. When I first tried using this PC with Windows, any type of workload from the simplest of tasks like using Google Chrome to something more intensive like video encoding or playing a Microsoft Store game would cause the fan to speed up and make noise. Since using this PC with Mac OS, the fan doesn't kick in as much as it would on Windows, except for intensive workloads like rendering a video, video conversion, and more. If anyone is planning to replicate this setup, high fan noise is to be expected and just to be dealt with. Besides these issues, I've had a fairly good experience with this Hackintosh. Thanks to the patches I've made, it's been reliable as a day-to-day -day PC. I even used the Hackintosh to edit this last portion of the video with a trial version of Premiere Elements. Just as a quick comparison when running something like Cinebench on this machine, the macOS results are pretty much on par with the Windows version on the CPU side. The graphics are kind of lagging, but it gets the job done with what I expect from this PC. As I stated near the beginning of this video, I'm actively working on getting High Sierra onto this PC and will make a video on it when it seems stable, so be on the lookout for that. But for now, this is Steve signing off, and now with a new Hackintosh.